Uh, welcome, Reds Country. Thank you for joining us for our second uh, episode of Share the Truth. My name is Corey Hawthorne, Director of Player Relations and Promotional Events for the Cincinnati Reds. And I want to thank you for joining us for our Share the Truth series. The Cincinnati Reds are committed to turning words of action as we all look for ways to address racism, equality, and social injustice in our society and our continuing effort to the to and our continuing effort to drive this positive change we want to share as many resources as possible for people in red countries and beyond and the share of the truth is a great series that it's going to do just that it's going to talk about things that are happening in real time that are affecting our society and we're going to be very raw real and honest about those things so we can expand our hearts and minds and grow as a country and for everyone in red country um, this Share the Truth um, episode is titled, Hear What Matters to Garrett, Bowman, and Biddle. And we've got three awesome guests who are some powerhouse players in our bullpen this season. So first, let's start. <clears throat> He's a left-hander reliever out of the bullpen who was a 2011 Red Draft pick from Victorville, California, who attended St. John's University and actually played basketball there. We've got Amir Garrett. What's up, guys? Also joining us today, we've got another right-handed reliever who's a native of Chevy Chase, Maryland, who attended Princeton and has spent three seasons with the Cardinals before the Reds were lucky enough to have him join the Reds' bullpen in 2019. Let's welcome Matt Bowman. Hi, everyone. And then finally, last but not least, he's a left-handed relief pitcher who was the 27th overall pick in the 2010 MLB draft. He was selected by the Philadelphia Philly, and he's a Philly native himself who spent most of his big league career with the Braves before the Reds were able to snatch him up and add him to the depth of the Reds' bullpen for the 2020 season. We've got Jesse Biddle. So, What's going on, everybody? I'm going to thank you guys for taking time out of your schedule to uh, join us today for the Share the Truth series. Like I said, this is very important for us to talk about things. And like I said, we're going to be very real, raw, and honest. And the three of you guys um, have done some great things and have been very active, even when there was no baseball going on. And we want to talk a little bit about those things that are going on in the country today. Obviously, we know the, the senseless killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd has led our nation to have a new open light and awareness to a lot of the things that are going on in this country. And you guys have not been silent in that. And, you know, as a, as a black man, I, for one, want to thank you for not being silent, but you guys being athletes, some of the things expect you guys to say, people expect you guys to just stick to being baseball players and nothing else. You know, Amir, you're very uh, active on social media. And one of the things you says is that it's come to your attention that a lot of people don't value athletes having opinions on anything besides sports. And you're getting a lot of backlash because people just want you to stick to playing baseball and, you know, stay in your lane as far as that's concerned and keep what's going on in the world out of the sport. And they value you as an athlete, but not as a person. How does, how does that make you feel? Um, you know, it actually, it kind of, it kind of hurts. You know, because there's a lot of people at the ballpark, you know, before the game or after the game, like, mirror, 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 like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they want autographs and stuff like this. And it's like, you, you feel good, you know what I mean, to, to, to feel important to people. But when something like this happens, like, those same fans that are there and they want your autograph, they're like, oh, yeah, we don't, we don't like you when, you, when you when you're like this. We like you when you're playing and – you're not saying anything about the real world problems and <clears throat> we like you better on the mound. I mean, that's not fair to me, which I don't mind, but these real world situations, it's really happening. And, you know, I will not, I will not, you know, just cause baseball is coming back, just cause sports is coming back in general, I will not be quiet. I will not uh, act like there's nothing going on in the world. And you know, it's it's kind of tough because, you know, a lot of people say, you know, sports is their sense of normalcy or their sense of, uh, you know, getting away from the real world. But guess what? We, we can't get away from the real world. We can't. We have to tackle this thing full on. You know what I mean? And, and if we want the world to be a better place, this is what needs to happen. Just because sports is coming back, this is my platform. This is where all eyes are on me. This is how I can get the message I am trying to send out, you know, by me being on the TV, me having that platform, people see what I have to say or they hear what I have to say. And that's the easiest way to, to, to get out to people. You know, like I say, we, if we just change one person at a time, 
you know, we just we just try to get people to see different spec different things from different perspectives. You know, this country can be a the, the greatest country in the world, which it is, but it can be a it, it can be way better. You know, it could be a country that you know that we always talk about and the country that you know that we all love. And you know, I just it just feels like uh, it just it just doesn't sit right with me when um you know people are just saying just just be quiet and, and pitch. You know, and that that actually hurts. You know, and that makes me even think to myself, like, man, like, this is this is a harsh world. Like, like people are harsh. People are rude. People are mean. You know, and and that's that's the things I want to change, so we can be, you know, better as a country, man. And it's just, you know, at a time right now, you know, we all need to come together. That that's what this needs to be. You know, no matter what your views are, we all need to come together. You know, we all got to work together. You know, so we can make this country a better place. Absolutely. And speaking of coming together, um, obviously, I think people on social media expect you as a black athlete to, to have a certain, obviously, feeling and view on what's going on as a, as a black man yourself. But you have teammates like Jesse and Matt who are not black athletes, but yet have been outspoken about certain things. So, Matt, I want to start with you. What made you feel like that you needed to or wanted to, you know, be very vocal with everything going on um, in using your platform as an athlete? I mean, um, I mean, just going back to what Amir was saying that, like, you know, it, it seems like people are looking at Amir and saying, OK, we love it when you pitch like, but we don't look at you. You know, we don't look at the whole picture. We don't see that you're a full, you know, a fully formed human being with your own opinions and things that you uh that you want to make sure are brought to people's attention. And at least for me, I look at it and I say, it's difficult for me to fully understand what Amir is going through um, because I, it's not my lived experience, but I know Amir and I trust Amir and we've had these conversations and you know, I'm going to get behind Amir and I'm going to support him in what he's doing just because I trust him as a human being. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's difficult to watch all your black teammates sort of, when these things go on and everyone turns to them being like, what do you got? Like, leave, like, you know, this is on you. And I think about what my experience is and I get to just go play baseball. Nobody turns to me and goes, you know, what do you think about this, you know, these social justice issues? And so I just think it's unfair that every time you, you have these, you know, boiling, uh, these boil over moments that like, you just turn to the black athletes and you say, hey, this is on you. Like, you need to comment on this. Like, what do you think about this? And they get no support from uh, from their white teammates. So I think that, at least for me, it's been extremely important that if this is a cause that I believe in, and I really do, and I believe in Amir, um, and I believe in all my you know black coworkers, it's something that I feel like I needed to jump in and be a voice too, because you know they're being all off on an island, having to you know deal with this on their own. I just think it's unfair. So. You know, my feeling is any way I can be supportive of Amir and get behind all the other, you know, outspoken black athletes, I'm going to do that because that's an important um, allyship that needs to exist. Well, that's awesome. And uh, Jesse, obviously, you know, white players have a choice to jump into this conversation, whereas black players may not. And, you know, white players could, you, could choose to remove themselves from the conversation, but you, like Matt, have chosen not to remove yourself and have those comfortable conversations and be very vocal. And you and your fiance even attended um, Black Life Peaceful Rallies and protests in L.A. Talk to me about, tell us why you felt like it was important for you to be a part of that movement in light of all the, the coronavirus fears that are going on. Why was it important, you felt like, for you to be part of that movement um, with your fiance and then also be um, very outspoken on social media? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that the the first thing that jumps out at me, and this is the question I've asked myself a lot, is this isn't the first senseless killing that we've seen on tape, right? Like, these aren't the first ones that have been um, made public knowledge. And yet, it seems to be the time that um, we're jumping to action the most. And I, I think a part of that was just being in being in quarantine and having the time and energy to give to this that it properly needed. Um, and so, you know, it was really important to my fiance and I um, to, to take part in this in the best way that we can. Uh, but really, it comes back to what Amir said, which is, I wouldn't be any better than the fans that 
are asking Amir for his autograph, but not supporting his ideals um, and not supporting him as a person. If I was buddy, buddy with Amir in the clubhouse, but I'm not supporting, you know, his struggle through life and, and everything that, you know, he has to go through as well as, um, you know, other black men and women. And so, you know, I just, I've had a lot of black teammates. I have a lot of black friends. And I think that I just, I, I no longer wanted to just be somebody who was just happy to not be racist, right? I wanted to stand up for something and truly be anti-racist and really like do the research and learn and try to grow as a person and, and the best way that I, I mean, in any way I could really. You know, for, for you two guys, a lot of people may ask you guys, you know, a lot of the things that were affecting the black community have been happening and going on for a long time. So a lot of people may look at some of um, individuals who are supporting the cause and say, why now? You know, we talked about obviously people being quarantined with um, the COVID, you know, virus going on. Do you think that that's the reason why? Or, you know, what do you think the reason is that everyone is coming together now after the George Floyd death, knowing that there were the, you know, Breonna Taylors and so many other senseless killings? Why now for you guys? Um, I, I, I feel like what Jesse said, being in quarantine, uh, you know, that really shed a light on, you know, the George Floyd case and, you know, the, there were previous instances that happened, but there were so much things going on in the world. I felt like those got pushed to the side. You know, there were sports going on, whatever was on TV, but in quarantine, like you didn't have, you didn't have sports, you know, you didn't have stuff to distract you from what was going on in the outside world. You didn't have, you know, for a period of time, a lot of people didn't have, they weren't, they weren't working. You know what I mean? So all they were doing is sitting in quarantine at home and you click the TV on and there it is, George Floyd, you know, killed by a police officer. And I feel like this, this, this hit different for everybody because it finally brought it to light. Like this happens in the, in, in the black community over and over and over and over again. And you know, for somebody like me, like this ain't this ain't the first time. You know, I I knew about the other ones, and it's like you know, just just bringing the light in in with COVID and all that. That's all you had to do was just like really turn on TV and 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 watch this stuff, watch what was happening, and you know, I just felt like there was a lot of distractions. That's why the other ones weren't weren't brought to light. And, you know, just you know, just with COVID hitting. That's all you had to do was turn on the TV and, and see for yourself. Yeah, I, I think just to piggyback off of that, right, like this narrative of 2020 being like the worst year in, in history or whatever, to me, it's like, it seems like a year that we all needed, right? Like because of the political climate, as well as just like the the direction that our country is heading, I think that this is a reset and has given us a chance to really find some perspective and realign our values and hopefully bring us all together in a way that can better everybody. You know, when everything was going on at the height of everyone being very vocal on social media, I know Jesse that, you know, you wanted the conversation and dialogue to continue. When you saw the momentum on social media uh, dying down, it really sparked the idea that you and Matt came up with the fundraising efforts to keep that momentum going. And you guys ended up raising you know, over nine thousand dollars after matching to some some great causes, including the NAACP, Black Lives Matter Foundation, and Southern Poverty Law Center, just to name a few. You know, knowing that you guys wanted to do that to keep that momentum going, what do you think? Where does it go from here? You know, when, once the twenty twenty season starts and baseball gets underway, how do you guys keep the momentum going even further at this point? So, uh, uh, you know, I'll answer that first. Um, it's definitely a tough question because with sports coming back now, I feel like we have to push the conversations uh, a little bit more because, you know, the, the distractions are coming back. And if they come back, then all this is, will be swept under the rug, which we do not want to happen. We do not want to happen. So you know, keeping those conversations alive and just, you know, what we speak 
and what we want to see in the world, you know, we have to put that out there. Um, you know, I, I tweeted out just because I'm coming back to baseball, you know, let's not forget, you know, um, of what's going on in the world, you know, and Black Lives Matter. Um, so we have to continue to push the narrative of equality. Um, and I feel like, you know, with our platform, we're able to do that, you know, and even if it's just, you know, a simple gesture, you know, every time somebody turns on the TV, somebody, you know, sees me go out there and pitch, I have a little message or something on my hat. I want them to, to I want them to, to know that, you know, I'm still here and I'm still here for those that, that, that need me, you know, and, you know, it's going to be tough. Because like I said, distractions are coming back. So people are going to feel a sense of normalcy. They're going to go back to their daily lives. And, you know, a lot of people want to forget this stuff that's happening, you know. And that's not the case. I don't want them to forget. I just want to make changes moving forward. Matt, I think you were going to chime in on that as well. I was just going to say that, you know, uh, we've been using our platform so far in order to spread the message. And I guess when we come back, you know, like Amir said, we could fall back into, you know, the past that, you know, the past normal that we've always sort of been used to. Or we can say, okay, you know, we're going to continue using our platforms to talk about these issues that like, you know, we hold very close to our hearts. And there's sort of a decision point to be made where it's like, you know, will we continue to do the small things, you know, like you wear Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Uh, I, you know, we all appreciate that, you know, the Reds uh, send that out on Twitter, you know, Joey wears it, um, Amir wears it, Phil wears it, uh, Moose wears it, and that ends up getting traction on Twitter with, with the Reds. So making sure that our platforms are still sending out, you, we're using our platforms to send out the messages that we believe in. Uh, I think is is really important. And then I'll, I'll be honest, there, there are other ways that's pretty externally focused. Then there are ways that we can be more internally focused and we can sort of focus on this organization that we're a part of, the MLB, and the ways in which maybe the MLB is falling short. So um, when it comes to that, like there, there are a number of things that the MLB could do differently in order to make sure that they're more inclusive, more diverse, that, you know, the population in the MLB represents, you know, the population as a whole. Uh, you look around for, you know, the, uh, on opening day, I think last year, it was like 8% of, of the league was, were Black Americans. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's lower than it, than it should be. And for, you know, for an organization as, an, as the MLB who can tell me, you know, your pitch moves this much down to the centimeter, you can't tell me why it is that we don't have more black athletes, why we don't have more black coaches, why we don't have more black reporters, why there's one black GM, why I don't think there are any black ownership groups. And so, you know, I, I, I would say that it's great to use our platform to, you know, send this out publicly, but I also am recognizing that I'm part of an organization that isn't doing as much as they could. And so I wanna be focused externally, but I also wanna be focused internally. Um, and so how that happens, you know, may, maybe we just keep projecting out and using our platform to, to call this out, but perhaps maybe there are other ways that we can work internally uh, to talk to the league um, and see, hey, why is it that you can't get more than an 8% participation rate from black Americans? Why is it that the MLB has like the lowest professional sport participation rate from, from black people? Like, these are huge issues and, you know, just having a statement on it and, you know, just coming out and saying we stand with Black Lives Matter is a start, but there has to be real action after that. And so, you know, at the very least, we can question our organization and say, all right, what else is happening? What, what are you doing? What can we help to do in order to make sure that this sport reflects, you know, the America that I see that is inclusive and diverse? For all of you guys being so outspoken on wanting that change and, you know, fight for equality, do you guys kind of struggle or have second thoughts about making some of those um, social media posts or being very outspoken, knowing that you can potentially face some backlash and lose followers on social media? Jesse, I think you touched on that before. What are your thoughts on that as far as losing followers or having those naysayers? Um, I mean, it is what it is when it comes to that, right? Like, what are you going to do? Um, 
if those followers are are so uh, stingy that if I say Black Lives Matter, they're going to unfollow me. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really want them to begin with. But, you know, more than more, like, if we're going to grow, there's going to be, um, you're going to have to be uncomfortable, right? And you're going to have to say things that go against the grain a little bit. And um, I just think that this is all moving in the right direction. That's what it feels like. And, you know, to, to piggyback on what Matt said, like a lot of it comes uh, for me, at least it, it's, it's internal. Right. And I, I feel like every day I'm trying to learn and trying to grow and trying to um, educate myself as much as possible, because at the, like we have so much information at our fingertips and to not be educating yourself is a ch choice. And um, that choice, unfortunately, it, it, you just can't make it anymore. You know, as, as far as, you know, being silent, Amir, how do you, how does it make you feel if you have guys in the clubhouse that may be unlike Jesse and Matt, who may have been remaining silent or not using your social media platform during a time like this? Does that hurt you a little bit or? Um, at first it, it did hurt me. It did. But I also had to realize not everybody copes with what we're going through in the same way, you know? It's okay. There's, there's, I know there's numerous amount of teammates that are, they're silent, but they're doing what they can. You know, they're, they're, they're learning, they're teaching themselves. And then whenever they're ready, they venture out to me and like, ask me questions like, yeah, I, I didn't think like, you know, this was a topic I should talk on, but you know, I had to educate myself a little bit. Like what's the next step? You know what I'm saying? They're just venturing out their bubble a little bit. And that, that that's, that's completely fine because, you know, for a while there, I was, I was in that bubble as well, you know, from Colin Kaepernick Nian to Bruce Maxwell Nian, like I wanted to help those guys. I wanted to support those guys, but I couldn't support them because I didn't feel and I didn't feel that I was in a position that I could because I would fear for my job. Mm -hmm. And that that's such a uh that that feeling just sucks because you know they're doing it for the right reasons and you want to be a part of the cause and you want to help but I just couldn't and that's how I feel like uh, some of my teammates that don't speak out publicly or whatever it's fine you know they'll come around you know when they feel it in their heart you know what I mean when they feel it in their heart they'll come around and uh you know I, I tell my teammates every single day you know when I put a, a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on to go out to the field and they ask me like do you want me to wear one like whatever I'm like no you don't have to wear one if you don't want to just wear it wear it for you wear it if you want to wear it don't wear it because I think that you that I think that you should wear it. That's not that's not what I want to do, um, you know. Because I know all of my teammates are good people. Uh, I know they love me to death, and I love them to death. And it's just, you know, I don't I don't I don't get upset about stuff like that because you know I was the same way with with different um, with different circumstances, you know. I really didn't venture out. And then all of a sudden I did because I felt that in my heart, I felt it was the right thing to do. And I felt comfortable, comfortable enough to do it and to talk on these, on these, uh, about these problems. So, you know, whenever they come around, you know, that's fine. If they don't come around, that's fine too. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not going to judge them off anything, you know, and uh, I am appreciative of Jesse and, and, and Bowman for sure. You know, cause from the start they were, I, they did it on their own. You know what I mean? So I, I don't want to pressure anybody to do anything that they don't want to do. Knowing that you now have great allies in your clubhouse like Jesse and Matt to, to really help the cause, do you feel like now you can really be outspoken and say what you want to say and not be able, not feel like you have to shy away from those things and fear of losing your job now? Yeah, man, it's it's, it's tough. Like, like Matt said, there was 8% of uh, black athletes in the MLB. That's, that's, so I think I believe that's like 50 something people you know what I mean and it was I didn't we really didn't have a voice we didn't have any power you know and for my teammates to get around me and support me on this that just shows a lot man like it just made me more comfortable and it made me you know think about like you know I'm ready for the consequences even though I don't, I don't think there will be any, you know, for me being outspoken and talking about the real world issues, 
but it's definitely make me it makes me comfortable that you know I have teammates like these guys and you know like Joey and stuff like that and it it helps me be who I am you know it just helps me it just it, it just, you just feel so much support from your from your teammates, and it's just it's an awesome feeling, you know. Because Matt said, you know, as a black athlete, it did feel like I was on an island by myself. When something like this happened, I did feel like I was alone, you know, because I couldn't talk to any of my teammates about certain situations because they didn't really understand they didn't really understand how I felt about this and how I deeply felt about it, you know, because it, it it affects my community. Um, and even if it didn't directly affect me, it affected those around me, you know, and how people looked at me. So, you know, by them stepping up, you know, it definitely made me so much more comfortable, so much more comfortable. Well, I commend all three of you guys for using your platform in a very positive way and trying to reinforce, you know, what we're trying to change here in this country and being, you know, equality and, you know, trying to understand that everyone, you know, what Black Lives Matters means. But it leads me to our next topic. I want to talk to you guys and get your, your views and thoughts on what does it mean when somebody says Black Lives Matters, but then somebody re replies and says, no, all lives matter. What do you guys think about when you, when you hear that debate back and forth about all lives matter versus Black Lives Matter? What do you think, Jesse? What? Oh. I, I'll let Amir start. All right. All right. So when I say Black Lives Matter, I, obviously I know all lives matter. We all know all lives matter, but there's an emphasis on black lives right now because those are the ones that have, who have the problems uh, right at this moment with police brutality, with inequality. And my whole thing is if all lives matter, then the all lives matter people should be as equally upset about what happened to George Floyd. Because if black lives don't matter, then technically all lives don't, right? So, and I feel like when people say all lives matter, I can tell the people that say all lives matter, I can, I can tell the ones that are just trying to justify themselves as not being racist. You know, there's, just like, there's, there's been instances I had talks with people, you know, with family members, you know, with, with distant cousins that are white. And I say, and they, they say all lives matter. And I'm like, can you say black lives matter? And they say all lives matter. You know, I say white lives matter, but can you say black lives matter? They say all lives matter. It's stupid. All lives matter. So I'm just like, you, you can't even say it because you don't believe that. So then you, ne you don't necessarily believe all lives matter. It's not the truth. So when I say black lives matter, again, I'm not saying that you guys aren't right, but I'm just putting the emphasis on black lives because those are the ones, we are the ones that are going through what we're going through right now. And, uh, you know, like I said, you know, I, I hear when you guys say all lives matter, but right now there's just an emphasis, there's an emphasis on black lives and, you know, I'm pushing that, I'm gonna push that and I'm gonna continue to push it. So that's it with me. Jesse and Matt, anything to add on that topic? I know you've seen that a lot on social media when people are putting out Black Lives Matter. You have some people that will reply and say all lives matter. Any, any thoughts on that or anything you've experienced and seeing in your comments on social media to, to people having that response? I would say that, you know, there, there are a couple ways to look at people who respond with all lives matter. Like a generous way would be saying, that you know they are actually looking for equality and perhaps you know uh they you know they want they want to make sure that like everyone is included I, I remember ironically underneath i think our other interview that we did someone said what about like asian lives and like latino lives and it's like absolutely um i am actually you know asian american and i certainly know that i am not facing anywhere near what Amir and my, you know, my other black teammates are facing. So I'm not so, con you know, it rings as disingenuous uh, if you're saying all lives matter. But what I honestly, what I really hear when I hear all lives matter is that, you know, when I, when we say black lives matter, what we're saying is black lives matter too. We're not saying they matter more. We're not saying, you know, like 
screw everyone else. It's not some, it's not some, you know, piece of pie or some pie where everyone gets just a little bit. And if someone gets more, that means someone gets less. What it means to me is that, you know, black lives need to matter as much as all other lives. And anyone, when I, sort of what I hear when I hear uh, all lives matter is you want to keep the status quo. You want to, you said, you're saying to me, like the way things have existed, where we value life generally, that works for me. And I don't want to see some big change to like the way we think about um, how we're valuing lives. And, you know, I think that, you know, over time, systemically, black lives have been undervalued. And that is why we have to sit here and say black lives matter and all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Um, and so sort of that's, that's what I think of when I hear, when I hear all lives matter. I, I just, I, I think, you know, there's room for us to expand our empathy and our sympathy for everyone. And it isn't some zero sum game where, okay, if I say black lives matter, that means that, you know, white people matter less or anything like that. It's like, let's, let's expand our thinking and let's expand our ability to empathize and understand other people's situations so that it's not some zero sum game. Like we have room for all black lives to matter. Um, and then, you know, and then we can say, great, like all lives matter once black lives matter as much. Awesome. You know, uh, I, I, I agree with everything that Matt said, you know, sometimes these, when we, we do stuff like this, sometimes the, the, what I want to say really doesn't come out, you know, all that well. Matt said it perfectly. Um, and also when you say black lives matter, and then, you know, I get a lot of feedback to a lot of people say all lives matter. I'm not looking to debate with anybody. I'm really not looking to debate with anybody. And I feel like a lot of people say that because they want to get a reaction. They want to see how I react, but maybe that's just, that's just me. But, you know, like Matt says, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Not saying that black lives should be superior in any way, shape or form, but you know, it's just right now, you know, I, I know everybody's seen the, the, like the examples of stuff of the houses and stuff like that. And it's right now, this is who we, who we got to, who we got to help out right now, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue to say black lives matter, knowing that all lives matter as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that when I see somebody say all lives matter, a lot of the times it, it just feels like they've been given some bad information or <laughs> they're willingly ignoring some of the, the, the numbers are all out there, right? Like all of this information is there for you to see. It's clear as day that black lives, especially in lower income neighborhoods have not mattered as much for our nation's history. And so that, be, that became like a norm. And so for you to challenge the, the idea that black lives matter is to challenge what has been the conventional wisdom for a long time and something that we haven't acknowledged for hundreds of years. So I, I just think it's all about getting good information and you know, it's all right there for you, you know? Oh, absolutely. Amir, that's interesting you brought that up. I had a, a conversation with one of my life friends and I tried to explain it to them using that house metaphor saying, you know, yeah. if you're in a neighborhood and the house is on fire, are you gonna say all houses matter or focus your efforts on the burning house? And trying to explain it, people say black lives matter not because they don't think that all lives matter but because it's pretty clear that a significant portion of an African American a, a significant portion of American population don't think that black lives matter and yes. black people represent the burning house in the neighborhood and we need the help of everyone um, guys like Matt and guys like Jesse to focus their efforts on putting that fire out which the fire represents the racism the social injustice and inequality in America for black people and for anyone who can't say black lives matter I say to them, you know, don't be mad you don't have a movement. Be happy that you don't need one. You know, that's the yeah. biggest thing. And that's that's the biggest thing for me too, Corey. Like, for us to sit here and have to say like, Black Lives Matter, like, that 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 sucks because it's like we're all people. Like, yeah, just be happy you don't need one exactly what you just said be happily be happy you don't need to say you know my race matters white matters latino matters or you know because it just sucks man it just sucks you know we're living in a time right now it's just it's it's horrible 
you know, for us to even have to say Black Lives Matter, it's, it's, it's terrible. Yeah, like Jesse said earlier, 2020 is a very unique year with a lot of crazy things going on. And as we're, you know, quote unquote, adjusting to the new norm, um, things are changing and sports are trying to restart once again. And with the restarting of some sports, we've already seen some pretty, you know, great stance and outspoken signs and efforts on trying to bring awareness to all the injustices they were facing in America. And one of the ones that come to mind immediately <clears throat> um, is, is NASCAR. You know, you know, what are your what are your guys' thoughts on NASCAR banning the the Confederate flag from their sports? And what do you think other professional sports leagues? Um, are and what other sports teams are doing as they return i think you know that's a that's a step in the right direction mm -hmm. uh them banning the confederate flag um because that that was the history that we we're used to like when i talk to the, my friends and they're like yeah i want to go to a nascar race they're like why do you want to go see that white man sport stereotype white man sport it shouldn't be labeled as that just it's just a sport it's just nascar you know, and it's so crazy to me because when I see that Confederate flag, it means something different for me. Like when I, I'm, I'm from the West Coast, so we, I don't really see, you know, those, those flags, you know, flying around too mm -hmm. much as, as somebody opposed to the, to the South, like Phil, like, you know, he probably sees those flags all the time. But like, I remember growing up and like, like, like. If my dad would be like, oh yeah, that's on somebody's car, like son, like don't don't even go over there. You know what I'm saying? Like don't even don't even mess with them because they don't like you. And I feel like NASCAR by them doing that, it's showing that, you know, they're not blind to what's happening in the world anymore. I mean, you know, they 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 seen, they've heard the people, and they're taking the, the necessary steps to to move forward, you know to not support um, to not support these injustices. And I can tell they want equality because the way that, you know, the whole NASCAR, the NASCAR family is getting behind uh, Bubba. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just, it's an amazing feeling. It's it probably for him. It's an amazing feeling because I, I think he's the only black person in NASCAR. So for them to, to take those necessary steps, it's, it's huge, man. It's huge. And I would like to see a lot of other sports, you know, follow suit as well. Um, like Matt says, like, what, what can we do internally and what can we do to help the game? I don't have all the answers, but, you know, there's, there's definitely extra steps we can take as an organization in, in MLB and to, to spread the word and, you know, not let us go back to normalcy of what, what was the past because, you know, the only way we're going to move forward if we make changes. And I don't know what those changes are right now, but, you know, I'll, I'll be working on, you know, some thoughts and some ideas for it. Yeah, I would just say, like, you know, you can almost look at the MLB as, and this is, you know, this is going to boil it down maybe a little too much, but like, you know, the NBA, the NFL, like predominantly black leagues, um, and you can almost look at those leagues as like, you know, the emirs of their team, of the, as the fills of their team. And it's like, you know, they're very outspoken. They know what they're doing. Like all, you know, they have what the NBA is like 70% black, I want to say. Like, you know, they as a league are going to be doing what they can. Um, and then you have the MLB at like 7%. And it's like, what can we do almost as the white friend? You know, like, what, what can we do to show our support? Because this isn't just a black issue. Like, this is an issue for everyone. And perhaps the MLB can take, you know, take notes and say, all right, like, we may not have as robust a, you know, or as diverse a uh, um, constituency as these other leagues, but there is so much that we can do as a league and let people know you know, this isn't just for, you know, the NBA or, you know, the NFL, like this is for MLB, this is for everyone. And we need to step up as well. And the fact that NASCAR is doing it sort of shows, you know, you know, we, they're supporting Bubba Wallace. And I think that the MLB should be doing similar things. And like Amir, I don't, I don't have the answers. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we can be doing as players, but certainly have some ideas as an or for us as an organization 
what can be done better. Um, and I guess like now might be a decent time to say it just because, you know, we're using our platforms, but like, you know, we have MLB has one black manager, I think Dusty Baker, that's, and that's it. And so if you want to make these arguments about, okay, like you need enough black players in order to get MLB players, like, okay, that, that'll take a while. I can understand, but like these positions get hired and it's everyone's choice. Like one black manager, that's it. Like that's all we, we can come up with. One black GM, that's all we can come up with. You know, White Sox, one, one black VP uh, of, of baseball ops. And that's, that's all we've got. Like, I know we have the C-League rule, which is like, you have to interview one black candidate for every upper level position, but it's like, that is an outdated rule. Like we can do better than that. Um, so I just, you know, again, I'm looking at the MLB and I'm like, we can do more. And I hope that we're going to do more because, you know, when NASCAR is doing more than we are at the moment, which I honestly kind of think that they might be, it's, it's just not enough. I, I understand that we are promoting black lives matter. I understand that, you know, the commissioner gave a statement before the draft on black lives matter. I understand that we, you know, we're a little tardy to giving a statement on George Floyd's death, but we ended up giving one. But again, I really, really would love to see us take some concrete steps toward uh, toward being more inclusive. And and there are such it just it feels like there's so much low hanging fruit that we could do, and that we're not doing yet. And it's just sort of been an issue where we might have just checked the box, and you said we made our statement, and it's just like we got time right now. Like, please, please, let's, let's start doing some things and let's start showing our support. And, you know, I, I, it's, I'm not going to call it disappointing, but I, I, I'm looking and I'm, and I want there to be more for this sport. And that goes, what Matt said, equality, equal opportunity, you know, no matter what, no matter what race you are, you know, I see I seen Cam Newton say something the other day. Yesterday, I was watching a video. He says, no matter what race you are, equal opportunity. If you're good at that position, you need to get that position, right? Regardless of color. And everybody, they just need the the exact opportunity as other races. You know, and that's just the world we live in these days. This is just it is what it is. And you know, like Matt said, like, you don't want to call it disappointing, but there is much more that MLB can do. I feel like, you know, I was pretty upset about the, you know, the statement got out late. And I'm thinking to myself, why, why this happened a week and a half ago? Why are we just now coming out with a statement? Like, come on now, like we can do better. We can definitely do better, you know? So, but I also feel like, you know, MLB having such, you know, small amount of black players, they don't want to overstep any boundaries and it's like they don't want to they don't want to put their neck out for you know the african-american community because you know this game is you know like eight percent but no that's how you you expand the game you get people on your side you know and it's just like you know there's a lot more they can do there's a lot more they can say you know and, and i don't i don't i didn't i didn't even feel that some of the stuff and this is my own organization it wasn't wasn't genuine and I'm just gonna call it how I see it. It wasn't genuine. They just they just came out with a statement just because, you know. But that's just that's just how I feel. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple things jump out to me in terms of steps that the MLB can take. And and one is to institute. You know, you guys know this as well as anybody, right? Like, how many meetings do we have in spring training, right? Mm -hmm. And and maybe instituting a, a race relations meeting or or something where we discuss African American history and. Um, just something that can help provide good information for people. Um, and then the second one is just maybe a little bit more institutional, but there needs to be more money sunk into building baseball in inner cities. You know, I mean, I come from inner city Philly and people, I mean, we have a lot of talented athletes in Philadelphia, but a lot of them play basketball or football. And I think that that's because baseball just isn't propped up in the same way. Um, and they and a lot of inner city kids don't see that same avenue to making it to the MLB that they do to other sports. I agree. I'm gonna agree. yeah. I'm gonna chime in on this. I wasn't gonna. I was gonna try and stay away from this, but I completely agree, Jesse. Like, if we want to talk about making sure that we have more black athletes downstream, like 
let's just look at this last draft. We, we took it down to five rounds and then the most you could sign for was $20,000. And then when you get into the minor leagues, you're making less than $15,000 a year. Like they're not going to be inner city kids and people who are, who are like socioeconomically challenged that are going to say, yeah, this is the path for me. Like this makes sense. Baseball is an expensive sport. Like I am privileged. Like I know how many lessons I paid for. I know that I was on a travel team. Like, you know, even in getting drafted, I was like, I'm going to take a risk because like, I know that I have a safety net underneath me. Like I, I look at guys like myself, even Garrett Cole, who gets drafted out of high school and he turned down $4 million. Like that's, that comes from a place of privilege and you're going to get a certain type of player when you are just, you know, feeding into, all right, you have to be, you know, you have to be able to play this expensive sport. You have to be able to train yourself. And it's like Amir takes a huge risk and, you know, he may not, he doesn't come from the same privileged background that, that I do. And he takes a huge risk to play, but Amir, as he'll tell you, Amir's different. Like, you know, like he made it, he beat all the odds, but like you can't expect black athletes and black kids to all end up like Amir and take that chance when at the end of the day, like they're not getting paid anything. Like the fact that minor leaguers get paid what they get paid and it can take five years to get to the big leagues. Like people don't have that, that amount of time and they don't have that financial flexibility. And I think not recognizing that is part of the problem. Like, you know, the, all of this money, if you want to save money on the draft and you want to have people signing for $20,000, like, please show me that money going to the RBI program. Like, please show me how you're going to reinvest that money to grow the sport and especially keep it diverse. So if you're going to have statements on it, if you're going to make a statement right before the draft about how, you know, Black Lives Matter and diversity matters and we're going to do more, really easy to just say, hey, we just saved millions and millions of dollars on this draft. Like, a lot of that money is going to go to RBI kids because I promise you, you know, there weren't as many RBI kids that are getting opportunities and getting drafted when you cut that draft short. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's an issue I'm very passionate about. Um, and I think it disproportionately affects the black community. Um, and so I, I, I think it's relevant to this talk topic. Absolutely. Well, I agree a hundred percent with you, Matt, on that, you know, and we could do a lot of things different. You know, they say black lives matter. They have to show me, you know, just like you said with the inner cities and stuff like that, you know, I was a victim of that as well, you know, playing baseball and you're not necessarily having the resources or, you know, the money to have a, a travel ball team. So guess what you do as, as, as a black kid, you go and play football, you go and play basketball. You know what I'm saying? The, the sports that we're really good at. And I'm not paying that money to be on a football team or a basketball team. You're good. You're, you're going to play. You're going to play. They want you. You're going to play. But in baseball, baseball, like you said, so expensive, so expensive. You know what I mean? And there's a lot we can do. We can we can get back to the RBI complexes. You know, we can we can put more baseball, nicer baseball fields in the inner cities because there's baseball fields, but they're not good ones. You, okay, you go to LA, you be in like you know in, in the inner city, the field's messed up. You go to Beverly Hills, the field is nice out there. So let's, let's, how about we go in, you know, go to inner cities, you know, in the poverty areas and make these fields nicer and make it more appealing to black players. Because if you make it more appealing to them, they're going to love this game. You know, they're going to love this game. This game is such a beautiful game to play. You know, a lot of kids don't, they don't like playing it because they don't have the resources. It's too expensive. You know, you see the, the, the field on the corner. It's terrible. It's trash. They don't care. So, you know, that's, that's just ways that we can help. We can put the money back into the inner city. Uh, fields and, and stuff like that and, and let's make baseball for everybody less expensive <laughs> yeah the the rbi programs have major league teams attached to them they should be elite you know like they should be people should be lining up to play for them and i know in philly like they weren't really taken seriously you know there just wasn't you know i, I don't know it does bother me it always has I think you guys are definitely speaking. There, the system is definitely falls on many avenues. It's one of the things, you know, I'm very fortunate and proud to be part of the Reds organization because I do know that our team owner, Bob Castellini, he is very much committed to making sure that baseball continues in the game for all people in the city of Cincinnati, all across the city. 
you know, every year the, the Reds, you know, they partner with the P&G and do field makeovers and they're constantly renovating fields, not only in the suburbs, but in the major city and they've got match programs. So we're very fortunate, despite the fact that we're one of the smaller market teams, the attention that our ownership group puts to those programs that you guys are speaking of are great. And I know Matt and Amir, you guys have both been out to the academy before and want to continue to invite you guys back out there because it is important for those young players to hear and see you guys to continue that pipeline to make sure that we continually have um, diversity in our sport. And I think we're doing a great job as an organization. And I wish I, I would I would challenge other organizations to model what we're doing because while we, while we can't fix the system overall, what the league is doing, I think we can at least worry about what we're doing here at home in Cincinnati. And I think we're doing a great job. And with guys like you who are being very open and honest and continuing to champion and inspire change, I think we are definitely on the right path. And that's part of the reason why the Reds are committed to, you know, putting those words into action and, and trying to find ways to address racism, equality, and social justice like this platform here of uh, Share the Truth. So with that, I want to thank you guys for being here today and for the viewers of being part of this episode of Share the Truth to hear what matters to Amir Garrett, Jesse Biddle, and Matt Bowman. And we wish you guys nothing but the best of luck in 2020. And we're excited to see what's going to happen, not only with the wins and losses, but also what's going to happen as far as uh, the, the social justice change and the, the, the prominent light that's going to be placed on this 2020 season. And with you guys being outspoken, I think we're definitely in a, going in the right direction. So thank you guys. Best of luck this season. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in another episode of Share the Truth in the Near Future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Thank you guys.